The scripture lessons this morning begin with Psalm 107, verses 1 to 3, and then continuing with verses 17 through 22. If you'd like to follow along in the Pew Bible, you may do so at page 559 in the Old Testament. Listen for the word of the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. The second lesson this morning can be found in Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10 and this is the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Listen for the further word of God. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you, in which you once lived, following the course of this world following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Sin is a pesky thing. It's like the mosquito that buzzes in our ear and we can't quite catch. It's like that fly that we've swatted away from our food, but it keeps coming back time after time. It's that thought that keeps you up long after you've gone to bed. It's like the doorbell ringing just as you sit down after a long day. Sin gets in the way, plain and simple. I often hear people say, I like to feel good when I go to church. Me too. But we have this little thing called sin, and it's bothersome, and it gets in the way. And if we could just get rid of that, then everything would be great. We'd also have two pages of our Bible, but... <laughs> No big deal. When uh, Reverend Craig Barnes, the president of Princeton Theological Seminary, was here in November of 2013, he said, the first two pages of the Bible are extremely important to us because it is the only glimpse we have of what God had in mind for us from the beginning. It was sheer paradise. Then we messed that up, and the entire rest of the book is all about the recovery plan. 
Today's scriptures address sin head on. So here we go. And I promise it's not all bad news. What is sin? My favorite definition is uh, disordered love. Disordered love. Sin is separation from God. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is having muddled priorities. Sin is being addicted to anything less than God. Sin is a violation of God's commandments. We are plagued by sin. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. I feel dirty just kind of saying that, but it's true. So who's to blame? Because surely there's someone to blame that we are sinful. Should we blame Eve? Perhaps Adam? The devil? Ourselves? Perhaps we have gone down a long rabbit trail since those first two pages of the Bible. In our Ephesians passage in verse 2, it references that we once followed uh, the ruler of the power of the air. The ruler of the power of the air. This idea comes from Greek mythology that believed all the space between the moon and the earth, so all of that air, was ruled by evil powers. Um, some of them were benign and didn't bother us, but others controlled us. So that's where that saying comes from in our scripture today. In Hollywood, they do a really good job of depicting evil as this uh, dark, cloaked figure that likes to hide in crevices and, and in the shadows and jumps out at us. But what if evil or sin wasn't so mysterious? Ian Markham in the Feasting on the Word commentary poses that evil is any external agency that enslaves us. Evil is any external agency that enslaves us. So for example, this could be addiction, or perhaps the baggage and the damages from our lives that we carry with us, perhaps social injustice, any external agency that enslaves us. In our Ephesians passage, evil is expressed in three ways. Sin, Satan, and self. We are dead in our sins. We are following evil powers. And we are consumed with passions of the flesh. So sin, Satan, self. In our psalm, it lists or depicts evil or sin in our lives four ways. The first is sin is depicted as wandering, meaning we are aimlessly heading towards death because of our sin. Second, sin is depicted as living in darkness or being imprisoned by, because of our sin. Third, is spiritual sickness because of sin. And fourth, it says sin causes us to go down, go down, meaning that we are living in distress and unrest because of our sin. But no matter how you define it, or no matter who is to blame, there's one thing that's for sure. We have a bad case of the sins. It is intrinsically part of who we are. So what do we do? Do we throw in the towel? Do we give up? More likely, it seems that society has taken the, if I don't acknowledge it, it doesn't exist approach. 
We live in an age of social media. Facebook, Twitter, the internet, Instagram, email, Snapfish, or Snap, Snapchat, sorry. Uh, some of you guys might recognize some of those, some of you don't, but they're out there, I promise. Um, and with these, we create this image of ourselves through these, through social media. Even, I would venture to say, those Christmas cards that we send out with everyone smiling and, and the letter that says how wonderful everyone is doing. We create these images. We want to put our best foot forward. Perhaps you post a picture of your child winning the soccer tournament. Or when you go on vacation, you post the one picture where everyone is smiling and, of course, the picture of the perfect sunset. And we arrive at church in our Sunday best. And then we compare ourselves, everything that we know about ourselves, to these one-sided avatars that people have created of themselves, these one-sided images that people have created of themselves that look pretty perfect. We punish ourselves, and we're easily able to list off our flaws because we know them all so well when it seems like no one else quite experiences what we do. We are all too familiar with the ugly truths that seem to plague us, and we don't see them in anyone else. There is a TV show called Friends, that depicts six young adults living in New York City. Each character has a very stereotypical personality. One of them is named Monica. Monica is very OCD. Everything has its exact place. And her house, or her apartment, is, is manicured so it, it, it looks perfect and everything has its spot and everyone knows when you go into Monica's house you don't put your feet up on the coffee table and you make sure that you put things back where they belong because it's so perfect. In an episode titled The One with the Secret Closet, Monica's friends ask her what's in the hall closet. Well, the hall closet's locked. The rest of the episode, they, her friends spend the time trying to figure out what's in that closet, posing different uh, ideas, and also uh, using all of their skills to break into that closet. At the very end, they finally get the closet open and they open up the door, and from top to bottom, there is heaps and piles and mounds of junk. And Monica is mortified because this goes against that image that she has created of herself, of herself. I would venture to say that we're a bit like Monica. We hide our embarrassments and our insecurities and our sins and our weaknesses. And we worship the person that we pretend to be. We worship the person that we desire to be. So where's God in all this? Unfortunately, too often, we don't give God enough credit. We assume that what we've done is too much for God. That God will get tired of our antics and say, ugh, not you again. And will just quit forgiving us because we've tapped into that too many times. Recently, a friend of mine said, we've probably created God in our own image when we think that God doesn't like us very much. We diminish the grandeur of God and we trap God into human limitations. I can't forgive myself, so how could God forgive me? If I can't move past my judgment of my neighbors or the people that I see on TV or those who don't fall in step with my own standards then how can we begin to fathom a God who can't see past those same judgments? In our attempts to gain control, we actually lose control to the vices and distortions 
that we've inadvertently given a voice to. But this is not what God has intended. We were made for greater things. Here's where the good news comes in. I told you we'd get here. We have been redeemed. We have been made new. God breaks those human limitations that we put on God. God triumphs over the restrictions that we've placed upon God. And we are made new because God is good. We can join the psalmist in proclaiming, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. 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 I am grateful to proclaim that our foolishness does not disqualify us from the grace of God. Our foolishness does not discredit us from the grace of God. God forgives sinners and fools and offenders alike. There is nothing that is too big for God. As I mentioned earlier, our psalm lists four general themes of sin. And gratefully, these sins are not the final word. God meets us in our sins. God does not wait for us to get out of them. God meets us in our sins. So those who wandered aimlessly towards death were given new life through grace. Those who were living in sin and uh, in darkness and being imprisoned by their unwise lifestyles are set free by redemption. Those who are spiritually sick by sin experience, experience healing of the spirit. And those who are living in distress and unrest of sin are brought to safety in the loving embrace of our Lord. These sins are eradicated by God's love for humanity. I am not a linguist. I will never claim to be one. But there's something that's really cool that I wanted to point out at this, at this time. So if you look in your Bible, which I'm sure you all have opened, but don't worry if you don't, in Psalm 107, verse 1, it says, God's steadfast love endures forever. In Hebrew, the word that's translated steadfast love is hesed. Hesed. H-E-S-E-D. Hesed. At its most basic level, this word means love, but it means so much more than just love. Some ways that it's translated, we don't have an um, exact word or a word that, that fully encompasses and embraces all of what this means, but some ways that it's translated um, steadfast love, as it is in this verse, um, covenantal love, a loving kindness, mercy, um, but the idea behind this word, the idea that we can't fully grasp in one word of our own, is that we are loved by God with a love that can never, ever, ever, ever be broken or cast aside, ever. Ever. God has made an unbreakable promise, a covenant, to us, and, and, and in that is to love us unconditionally has said. It's this covenant that God will never break to love us unconditionally. So when we sin, God doesn't say, oh, you again, and roll his eyes. God, out of God's abundance of love, forgives us fully and completely, fully and completely, and we are made new. The ultimate show of God's love, of God's has said, is Christ's death on the cross. Lent is oftentimes called the journey to the cross. It is at this time that we purposefully 
journey towards the ultimate act of God's love. We know that Easter is coming. And so Lent is a time when we examine ourselves in hopes of becoming more like the people God created us to be, more like those first two pages of the Bible. Lent is a time of forgiving and allowing ourselves to be forgiven. We set aside this image of worldly perfection, this idol of perfection that we have created, and we focus on the abundant love of God. In Lent, we wrangle up all of that evil, all of that sin, and the destruction that we have ha allowed to take root in our lives, and we take away its power. With our eyes firmly fixed on the cross, we say, you do not have power over me anymore. Sin has lost its power. It's important to acknowledge that the work that is done is done by God. God is doing this, God has done this, and God will continue to do this long after today. We are made new and we are continually made new. God is the agent of change and we cannot take credit for that. We are merely the recipients of a remarkable love, a remarkable love. And in celebrating and acknowledging these good works that God does in us, we are challenged and encouraged to go out and do likewise. As God has poured an overwhelming amount of love onto us, we can't help but go out and share this love with others. We participate in God's has said. We participate in God's love. We participate in the resurrection by serving as a witness to this love and the grace that God has bestowed upon us. We do good works, not simply by writing a check or feeding the homeless or picking up trash. Those are good. But we also mimic God's unconditional love in all that we do. We also extend forgiveness. We also show compassion. We also offer grace. We strive for understanding. We keep our eyes firmly fixed on the cross. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. The Lord's love endures forever. Amen.